Well, that's one toilet coffee down, one toilet coffee to go. <laughs> oh, I love getting toilet coffee. It's almost as good as a toilet burger. Hi and welcome to the Writer's Lounge Podcast. I'm your host for the show, Steve Summerfeld. And if you haven't heard any of these Shed Talk miniseries episodes, these are just like a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly or kind of, you know, somewhat regular, semi-regular updates from the world of FMX where there's just maybe a bit of news or where I've been, what I'm up to and throwing, trying to sprinkle, blur out, trying to sprinkle as much uh, info from the world of FMX into this as I can. But right now, I am going on, what's the time? 11.30 Europe, or Central European time, which means it's 10.30 England. So at the moment, I'm going 28 and a half hours awake. Uh, I did have a 10-minute a power nap after the mountain bike ride yesterday, an hour and a half on the boat at 3 a.m., and I've just had a 30-minute power nap uh, at a petrol station near McDonald's, and that's where I managed to pick up my toilet coffee. So I am back in Germany. I'm on the Autobahn, and yes, you guessed it, I'm on the world's fastest roads, and I'm in the middle of roadworks because... That's what Germany does. Best cars. I'm following a BMW right now. They build the best cars. They build the best roads. But you cannot go fast on them because there's always roadworks and it'll be there for like 10 years for each section. Um, why did I call it a toilet coffee? Uh, the stupid thing. I hate this about Germany. I do like Germany. Don't get me wrong. I've already started bitching and moaning already. Probably because I've been in England for so long. Been there for a month now. Um, they charge you one euro to go to the toilet when you're on the highway. When you go to a petrol station. So before you go in, you've got to pay a euro. But if you do decide you want to buy something from the shop, then that euro does go towards whatever you're going to get. So... Being that I have had uh, collectively, oh, I don't know, two hours and ten minutes of sleep. No, maybe two hours and 25 minutes of sleep over the last 28 and a half hours. I decided I was going to get a McDonald's cappuccino and I got two for one with my coupon. How good is that? Uh, normally I'd use those coupons for toilet burgers. Um, they definitely come in quite handy. And they actually used to, when we first got over here to Germany, you could like save up all those toilet coupons and just go in and you're like, yeah, I've got like 10 coupons. Give me a free burger, please. Uh, that was awesome. And it would work from different petrol stations to the other. But as, as you can imagine, they've clamped down on that sort of stuff too. So uh, that's where I'm at. So why am I driving home now, 28 and a half hours already, and I still have another four hours to go. Should be home at 3.30, if there's no more traffic and no more roadworks. So I'm finally, finally coming home from that big UK and Belgium trip uh, that I started about a month ago, probably over a month ago now where I came over for Squibby's shows. That was the fun part. And the Monster Energy MotoGP and MXGP shows. One was at Lommel, Belgium. That was the start of the trip. Then crossed over from Belgium into England and then did the MotoGP at Silverstone. That was pretty damn awesome, I gotta say. And doing the VIP uh that was even better so we would host well i was hosting the show with desmond um and also matt crowhurst desmond tessamaker who you may know as one of the lunatics who i think it was a world record of like 75 foot backflip on a bmx or mountain bike i can't remember which one it was now it was at klagenfurt 2015 or 16 
Um, I rode that event with him, which was quite cool. And it's awesome to see, like, nearly 10 years later, we're both still somehow involved in our sports as commentators. So, yeah, we were together there uh, commentating the Silverstone show. That was three days of absolute gnarliness. I've probably already spoken about that show now. This, look, if I've already spoken about it, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm damn tired. Um, actually, I'm feeling a little bit refreshed. I've just had a power nap. So I think I can get the last four hours knocked out. But, yeah, maybe I already did talk about it. So I'm not going to carry on anymore. So I went from that monster show and continued on with Squib Freestyle. Jamie Squib, who has his two trucks uh, down there in Devon in England. One truck pretty much always on the road doing shows. And this time around, it was with Chris Birch. Birchy has returned. Birchy's like one of the first UK riders in FMX. Uh, he rode a couple of the X Fighters there at Battersea Power Station uh, in London. 2009, 2010, and I actually met him at the audition for the first ever Macau gigs that were to be in the casino, that House of Dancing Water, I think it's called, or Dancing, Water Dancing, uh, House, of, yeah, I think it might be the House of Dancing Water, I can't remember, I went to the audition with a bunch of other Aussies, a couple of Americans, I think there was a couple of Canadians, a few Euros thrown into the mix. Remember it was Birchie and Rayner and uh, Matt Cole, Joel Brown. I do remember Birchie getting absolutely loose in Zelzart in Belgium. And we very literally nearly left him behind. He nearly missed his flight because he got so loose. Didn't get back to the hotel. And uh, we had to make a call, but like, there's a lot of people who need to get on a flight right now. We're going. Birchie, you're on your own, pal. But he walked through the, the gate where the hotel was. Um, absolutely hanging. I think he probably only had one flip-flop on. He might not have. He probably had two shoes. But just for the purpose of this story, it was in a bad way. Um, but funnily enough, I met Chris Birch there. He was riding for FMX Forever. Um, and he was uh, kind of chauffeuring us guys around a little bit. And um, then he ended up doing nine years out in Macau. He never planned to do that gig, just kind of fell into it, I guess because of FMX Forever's involvement in it. So he had nine years out there, then it got closed down due to COVID. Four years chilling down in Spain, and... Um, now he's back, riding with Squibby the last month or so. So it was pretty cool doing those shows together with Squibby, with Birch. Uh, the only problem is driving around in Squibby's truck, which does not have air conditioning, and that gets mighty damn hot when you're sitting over the top of the engine and driving to all those shows. There was actually reasonably good weather this year doing the shows in England. So same thing as last year, I went over there, I was hosting the shows with Squibby, but basically I just wanted to go back to, you know, I'm not riding, but I just wanted to commentate the shows, help out a mate, and set the truck up with them, and just generally have a good time. So it was a good couple of weeks, well, it was about a month, but obviously broken up there with the monster shows in the middle, and uh, yeah, we smashed a whole bunch of shows from... Thornton Ladale, the big one up there in Yorkshire, and then um, yeah, there was a there was a heap. I can't remember all of them, but we went over to Guernsey. So the first time I've ever been to Guernsey, um, I found out some history because I was trying to figure out: is Guernsey a country? Did I just go to a new country? No, I did not. It is not a country. It is a Ah, oh, crap, I've forgotten what it's called. It's, ah, damn it, I've forgotten the technical term. It's part of the Channel Islands, which is under the British... 
the British Protectorate? Something like that. Ah, oh, man. Ah, oh, this was going to be the history lesson for you guys. Because uh, if I wasn't doing freestyle, I'd probably be doing uh, motorbike tours, giving uh, history lessons on a dirt bike going around somewhere. And I've absolutely failed, so you'd be wanting your money back now because I completely forgot what the technical term for Guernsey is, like Guernsey, Jersey, and a few other of those islands. So it does come under British rule, but they are basically their own people. They have their own flag, but they have a governor. So they don't have, a, they don't have the king. I guess the king is over them somehow, just like the king is over Australia. But they have a governor. They have a bailiff. So this was something I found quite interesting. We were setting up the show. And um, we went to go get some lunch in the committee tent at this... Uh, I can't remember what kind of show it was, but it was at like the Guernsey North show. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. You can't have any of that yummy suckling roast pork right now that had just been cut before we were about to do the first show. Because the bailiff was coming. I'm like, oh, the bailiff? Like, okay, isn't a bailiff got something to do with a prison or something like that? And I'm like, no, no, no. The bailiff has a very interesting role on the island of Guernsey. Along the lines of judge, jury, and executioner. So he can come up with laws. He creates the laws. He... Decides who is guilty, I suppose, of any penalties. And then administers, administers the penalties. I think I've got that right. So I'm, I'm trying to piece together uh, some of the history that I was taught while I was over there. This is probably very bloody boring for you guys, isn't it? Um, probably better if I got the story right. Anyway, shit happens. Uh, but it was quite cool because it is such a small island. We were staying in a really nice hotel awesome food but i walked the width of the island to go to the beach with one of the biggest tidal ranges i've ever seen it's 10 meters from low tide to high tide that water comes up so fast squibby and i we were in there freezing our tits off swimming in that water but it was definitely worth it but i would not be surprised if other people got washed away actually one of the bmx dudes that was there i think it was like Danger Dave or one of his mates. Uh, it's another UK group of um, BMX riders. One of them nearly got washed away. They were cliff diving. And, uh, yeah, the current is so friggin' strong. So, yeah, that's basically what I've been up to. And to finish it all off, the reason why I'm so tired, yesterday morning, woke up, and we decided we're going to go for an epic mountain bike ride on the e-bikes. Out from Squibby's place, um, we headed over to Dartmoor. So we actually, there was a show we went to, Oakhampton, where it just, it rained. It was so windy, rained the entire time. There was no freestyle happening there. But funnily enough, as we were talking on the microphone to try and keep the, the show happy... Uh, Scooby's like, oh yeah, you know, I used to ride across those moors over there, across those hills with his old man on the mountain bikes. Um, just sucks that we couldn't do the show. Well, funnily enough, two weeks later, we went over there on our mountain bikes and far out the wind that rips across those hills. It's, I, I don't understand how those hills kind of emerge and, and like the geological forces behind it. I think like it is from volcanic activity, but the wind that comes across it, the way the weather changes, like it's its own microclimate, yet there is not a single tree to be found on these massive hills. It rains, there's wind. It looks like you're at the top of Scotland or Iceland or something like that, but you're at the bottom of England where normally it's just green and... You know, yeah, it's just such a weird environment. So, yeah, no, we went riding our mountain bikes there, put in a solid three or four hours, um, about 20 miles, 30 kilometers we did, straight up. Uh, it was a pretty bloody epic ride, actually. And that's why I'm so freaking tired right now. Riding mountain bikes, 
washing it up, packing the van, jumping in the van last night, getting to Dover at 3 a.m. And now, like I said, it's like it's 11.40 the next day. <laughs> Still got a couple of hours before I get home. Four hours. Oh. So, there was actually, out of all of that, as you can guess, like I will probably be doing something like 30, 32 hours, 33 hours of driving by the time I get home. And it got me thinking about what it's like to ride freestyle motocross. And while I have definitely not forgotten what it's like to do these road trips, this time has reminded me how gnarly FMX is and when you are doing this as a job, the hours that you have to put in. We don't have to. You can fly if you're lucky enough. But if you're not that lucky and you want to have your bike and you need to drive somewhere, this is, this is what it's all about. And I love driving. I love just jumping in and going for a massive road trip. And I've done a lot of these kind of trips. But it is fucking dangerous. That's all I can say. So I was thinking about this as I was driving. I'm like, okay, what's the topic for today? And I'm going to go out there and say driving, oh, sorry, riding tired, which leads to dumb mistakes and dumb crashes. My last jump, it was not the fault of me driving 30 hours with about one hour's notice that I was going to a show, but it definitely didn't help. Um, my last ever jump was at Motorcycle Live 2017. The promoter in England called me about 31 hours before the first training session. And he said, oh, Steve, we need you. Last minute, of course. We need you to come to England. We need you to do the show. And can you drive to Berlin first and pick up a Kawasaki for Ryan Brown? Okay, what time's the show? Told me. And I'm like, fuck, that's in a day and a half. Um, I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll figure it out. I'll get there. So I told my missus who was actually already in England on holidays to see her family. I'm like, yep, I'm coming. Uh, I've just got this absolute, like the latest call up you could get. I guess I'm doing it. So I packed my bike in the van, drove four hours, maybe nearly five hours up to Berlin, picked up Ryan Brown's bike, threw that in the van and then pinned it straight to England crossing over from France over to England with the Euro Tunnel or with the ferry, I can't remember. Uh, and by the time I got to NEC in Birmingham, yeah, I was awake for 30 hours. Had a two-hour nap, put my helmet on, did the training session, and then went to the hotel. I was fucked. Absolutely fucked. I couldn't even really see. I was like, it's just the training session. All I need to do was just like jump it a couple of times. And I knew I kind of had it in me. I had that power nap and I felt pretty good. And so we went to the hotel. Really good night's sleep. And then found out we had to move hotels the next day. So that didn't really help with, you know, trying to catch up on those lost hours so we did the shows, moved to a different hotel. Then the next day, did the shows, moved to a different hotel again. And it just created this feeling of extra stress at a show that was not needed um, on top of just being tired from the very start. Like I started tired and it slowly got better. Don't get me wrong. Like I was every night I was sleeping as much as I could. I was trying to get power naps through the day to just try and recharge the batteries because it's a 10-day show and I'm trying to get through all 10 days unscathed and to do a good show and not be dangerous because I am riding with other dudes as well. So trying to be smart, trying to be good about it. And unfortunately, my last jump ever in FMX was on day eight of day 10 or, you know, of 10 days of shows. And I went for a seat grab flip, smallest mistake, didn't hook my foot, 
pulled hard because I wanted to go for a big one because I'd felt so good over the last few days leading into it. I'm like, fuck yeah, tomorrow's going to be sick. I'm going to, I'm going to go for this one. And I made the smallest mistake and it proved to be a career ending jump. It is what it is. I'm not blaming the 30 hour drive, but it didn't help. That is for sure. And then, you know, kind of looking back at the rest of my career, like I did two massive drives to Russia, from Germany to Russia. Uh, I think the, the uh, fastest drive I did there was 42 hours of driving over three days. I think the other, the longest one was maybe 48 hours of driving. Um, yeah, that, that was just what needed to be done. So many trips from Germany to Spain, uh, Germany and England a lot of times. And then if I think back to Australia, it was like driving from Brisbane to South Australia, stopping in at Sydney to pick up an airbag. Um, all those massive drives. And that's what everybody does. That's what all riders do. And I got to see that firsthand as I was watching Squibby driving his truck. So at least when I was doing it, I was in a van or in a car with a trailer. But driving a 12-ton truck, and he's the only one who has a license for it. Me and Birchie couldn't do anything other than trying to keep him awake, but we both failed at that. We were kind of both half asleep. And Squibby's there crisscrossing the country, sitting on a boat for 12 hours, trying to get those little bits of sleep in, Every show we'd turn up and he's basically in the back of the truck sleeping until 30 minutes before showtime. And I'm just like, yeah, the sport of FMX has, like that part hasn't changed. The hours, the long, long hours have not changed over 25 years. It's still the same as it was probably back at the start. And I'm not saying there's a solution to this. It's just an observation. I'm just like, fucking hell we push it. Like, every rider goes out there to do their best, to do the biggest tricks they can do uh, at the time, generally, and throw into that being tired, throw into that shit weather, throw into that maybe uh, an uphill or a downhill arena or bumps or whatever it might be there's so many things that goes into doing even the most basic of fmx shows let alone if you're traveling the world flying in for competitions next week we've got night of the jumps in zurich harry bink will be flying 24 hours in the air actually i think it's like 22.3 or 22.5 hours in the air, but there's two hours at the airport before you get there. There's packing your bags before you get to the airport. There's landing on the other side and going to the hotel, checking in. Maybe you can't check in yet. Oh, that van's... Oh, ho, ho. looks like she's about to blow. Oh, there's a lot of smoke coming out of that van. Oh, that's not good. <clears throat> Sorry, where was I? Um, yeah. Getting to the other side, getting to the next country, sorting yourself out. Maybe you can't check in. Maybe you've got to go straight to the arena and set your bike up. So it could be that you're on the road, on the hop for 30 hours, 36 hours, 40 hours, 48 hours. I know Pat Bowden did that once. He was like 48 hours on the hop to get to Europe one time to do a show from Australia. And then you've got to perform at the highest level of the sport. Not only your highest level, but what is relatively known that can be done. It's insane. Guys going to X Games, turning up there and being given like, I don't know, 15 minutes practice tops sometimes. Maybe it's different in the last year or two, I'm not sure. But in the old days, inside the, uh, what was it called? Staples Center. It was like a couple of five-minute prackies, and that was it. On top of all that travel, stress, everything like that. 
It is fucking gnarly. And then what you see is one rider throw down their best trick or their best run or the best show that they can give. So for any of the fans out there, this is maybe just like a little bit of background info that you may not have thought about. And for all the riders out there who are listening to this, yeah, it is what it is. Guys, girls, play it safe. Um, yeah, my, my career is over. Be- not because of it, like I said, but it didn't help. Uh, I'm sure it has led to a lot of crashes for other riders as well. And if any promoter may be listening, please consider this when all this is said and done. Like, even for, even for Harry, uh, we booked his flights to come over next week an extra day early just so he can have an extra day to try and get over jet lag. Didn't need to, but we're like, maybe it's better to have an extra day of hotel, time to chill out, and, yeah, try and get over at least the jet lag, at least the time that you're not asleep and try and catch up on your sleep pattern. Yeah, it's tough. Damn, it's tough. Right, uh, so that was... That went way off. Um, what was the other things that happened in the last week or so? Oh, yeah. I was watching the videos from... I'm going to butcher this dude's name. I'm really sorry. Nick... Nick Thomasumas? I don't know. I, I don't have uh, my phone in front of me to, to look at your name. Sorry, bud. But that dude, he's in all white gear riding on the Stark at the minute. His whips are getting so damn big. They were getting big anyway on the 450, but now on the Stark, looking so good. And then I watched him do that one-handed takeoff whip over like a, I don't know, maybe it was a 75-foot or 120-foot dirt jump. I can't remember what it was, but that looked awesome. To be whipping that big off of a dirt hit and doing it one-hand takeoff, like... That's Jared McNeil style there, off of a huge dirt hit. So that was cool to see him do that. And then Patrick Evans, the video that I just watched yesterday, or last night at Squibby's place, and he's doing this one-handed knack. It it was insane. The whip itself could near on win X Games. And then to one-hand knack it, and there was like this, I think it was like a can whip like single can whip looked unbelievable so i know there's still a lot of haters out there on those starks doing whips but man those two guys are shredding so much i just it just stuck out the last couple of days looking on youtube and looking on instagram and seeing that looks so damn cool i uh, just wanted to give it a quick mention it looks like we've got uh, more events coming up as well. I uh, just dropped... Actually, I haven't dropped it yet. But I've recorded the Night of the Jumps Rider invites for next week. I've already told you about Harry. He'll be there. Um, but I will have that on the Night of the Jumps podcast. If you haven't tuned in, Night of the Jumps, we have our own podcast there. I have been a little bit lazy on that one, only because the studio has been getting built, and I've said that for a long time. But new computer has arrived while I was away. All I need to do is basically set up the desk, and I'm ready to go. There'll be a lot more coming out from Night of the Jumps. But uh, tune in to Night of the Jumps on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever. And you'll get the writer's list. I'll probably even put it on here in a day or two as well. But I'll give them the first dibs on uh, getting that information out there. Because it always keeps the sponsors happy. Whereas I don't have any sponsors that I really need to keep happy. Which is the best part. Funnily enough, I turned down a couple of the sponsors. (laughs) I'm like, I'd rather... uh, I'd rather... Be as honest as possible and not have to think about which brands are supporting or may support me in the future for the Riders Lounge podcast 
and I think I'd only take a sponsorship if they're going to throw a ton of money, and I highly d doubt that's going to happen. So this way, I'm kind of free to say whatever I want, because this is my podcast, even though I do operate with different partners um, and do different gigs. I guess that's why you guys keep coming back and tuning in, because uh, I get to say what I like. Um, and that's why this one won't be on another podcast. This is only here. That's why it's called Shed Talk. Um, I think there was more. I did have, <coughs> I did have other things written down, but I don't actually remember what they were. So I may call this. I'll, I'll see if I can find on my OneNote if there was anything extra. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, the Project FMX video. That was another one. That was insane. I don't know if you guys have seen that one yet. Project FMX, you probably would have by now because there's more than a million people have watched it on YouTube from Monster Energy, but it is Jacko Strong out at his place with Harry Bink and Benny and Tommy Richards. It's like one of the best freestyle videos I've seen in a long time. Like, going back to old school, like, it looked like a segment from a Krusty or a Terra Firma or maybe a Rathchild. It was awesome. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, do yourself a favor, jump on YouTube now and look for FMX Project. It's awesome. Right, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm super tired. This has helped me to at least stay awake a little bit. I don't know how long I've been gone, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It has helped. I've got one more toilet coffee to drink. It's probably cold by now, but it'll probably be enough to get me home and on the couch. Actually, I'll probably just curl straight up in bed. I am done. Thanks very much, guys, for listening. And we'll see you soon on the Riders Lounge podcast. And we've got the live stream for Night of the Jumps next Saturday night on YouTube and Twitch. I will see you there 7 p.m. European time. Catch you later.